This presentation was recorded at the Best Practices for Pollinators Summit. For more information, contact pollinatorfriendly.org. Um, so, um, basically the concept of a flower is naked if it doesn't have a bug comes about um, when I, as a botanist, started taking pictures of flowers and flowers and got to the point where I got interested in insects and I got frustrated that flowers that didn't have an insect on them were naked. And I tell all my botanist friends there, you got to take pictures of the bugs. So I work for the Illinois Nature Preserves Commission. I've been with the commission for 27 years. I work in um, West Central Illinois. Uh, so here's basically, um, I have a home office there on the bend of the uh, Mississippi River on the bluffs there. And I, my area keeps changing. Um, I've got some new people coming on, so I'm helping train people. So I kind of shift quite a bit, but I have about 50, 50 uh, protected nature preserves and land and water reserves that I work on. Uh, plus I help others, especially with uh, insect related items. We have no uh, entomologist for the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. So I've um, gratefully been able to serve as that role to a certain extent. And I love that. Um, the great thing about my job is we are flexible and I'm able to use my expertise and my passions and desires uh, to kind of help fill a niche. And I really enjoyed that, that I've been able to transform my career over the last 27 years. So basically our job duties are land protection and management. We do conservation easements. We serve as the land trust for the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. So land protection is my top job, but those sites have to be defended uh, against various threats. Uh, we do management, obviously that's another threat. If we don't manage them, uh, these communities will disappear. And my favorite part is the flora and fauna inventory work. And we have to assess the sites to say if they're staying in a high quality state, are they getting better? Or are they basically being degraded? Um, and so we have to find a lot of assessment tools to determine that. A lot of that's been based on plants but I'm trying to move forward and try to look at things from a different perspective. So it's always neat. You look at all these, a lot of times I look at that, that picture right there of the sand prairie and I see that wall of dead because we just burned. But in the background, there's a wall of pine trees that are non-native. Um, so that's a blight on the landscape. But when I look through my camera, my little soda straw, my macro lens, I see the insect on that beautiful hoary pacoon and it takes away all the ugliness. And I see the beauty uh, on a small scale. And I start to see that the insects are still there. They still need a home. They still need me. Even though there may be a blight in the background, um, there is need, there is beauty there. There is incredible beauty with these insects. So before I get into bugs, which is my true love. So bugs, big B, meaning um, basically uh, members of the or suborder Heteroptera. Um, but back in 2018, I got frustrated after doing plants forever. Um, insects started becoming important, especially pollinators. And everybody was asking, uh, what do we know about pollinators and what are we gonna do about it? I said, do you have a plan? Because they had goals. So the Department of Natural Resources had goals to like, monitor pollinators, but I said, what is the plan? They said, we have no plan. Well, I wanted to have a plan. So I set out with my own little survey on my kind of my extra time that I have, not that we have any extra time, but I made time. So I visit six protected natural areas. So these are protected nature preserves and land and water reserves every year, four visits a year through the different seasons so I can see the different phenology. And I spend about 60 minutes or so wandering from flower patch to flower patch. So I take the path of least resistance. Sometimes it's straight down the stream bed or if there's a trail. Um, I don't have a lot of time to basically bushwhack through, you know, raspberries and everything. So I want to be able to make my way through without having to fight the vegetation um, and look for the insects on the patches of flowers. So I try to maintain this approximately the same route, but if different flower patches are blooming, I will visit those because I want to basically record as many different pollinators that are in the environment as I possibly can. So it's not so much that I'm trying to do this, this uh, kind of random consistent, I want to know what's there. Um, so I repeat these every, uh, five years. So six sites for every five years is a total of uh, 30 sites. So my goals were to establish a baseline for what these 30 preserves uh, have as far as insects. I wanted to know what insects were there. I wanted to find specialist pollinators associated with the different community types. So, you know, dry mesic prairie, uh, woodland, forest, uh, wetlands, things like that. And I wanted to uh, determine which insects were utilizing the rare plants on these communities. 
I wanted to get some new ideas for guiding our management because there's always that question about the use of prescribed fire and our a lot of a clearing. We're doing a lot of brush clearing. How is that impacting the pollinators? And I also wanted to collect information to develop kind of an assessment tool on how we can look at these communities through the eyes of the insects communities, not just the plants, because sometimes the insects have different needs than the plants do. Uh, so sometimes a really degraded field full of flowers that they actually use a lot uh, will be very important to a wide diversity of insects, whereas a botanist will look at that and go, oh my gosh, that's a bunch of weeds. So there's a different perspective there. Methods. So site selection, um, I travel a lot, but it's far easier if I can pick sites within about two hours or so from my office. Um, I usually do two sites per time. Uh, initially, all my sites were larger than 10 acres, but uh, later on in the study, I decided to do two one-acre cemeteries just to see if there was a difference uh, in you know, diversity and abundance on these little small-scale sites. I only actually surveyed those for 30 minutes because I'm all walking around in a little circle, um, and I kind of would run out. Data collection, I wanted to collect the number of sp species of each insect pollinator. Um, I actually did see a few ruby-throated hummingbirds, but that was inconsequential. <laughs> Uh, which flowering plants each one visited, uh, dates, time spent, you know, my duration, weather, I recorded all that, approximate route I would map, and the different types of community types I was going through. And then I recorded the uh, management history uh, that I had in my files or the heritage biologist would provide. I tried to take photographs of everything. So, so far I have photographed over 95% of everything that I have documented for this study. Not every individual, but every species or taxa I try to photograph. I probably photograph fewer butterflies. Uh, I've been doing butterfly surveys for about 25 years and they're easier to identify on the wing for me. Um, so lots of times if a swallowtail flies by, it's tiger swallowtail, I won't take the time to chase it. I'll just record tiger swallowtail and be done. I post a lot of these photographs on iNaturalist. I'm a big proponent of iNaturalist. Uh, I like it for the help of, of identification and to actually provide documentation uh, to a, you know, the community of scientists out there. Um, and I do a lot of networking through iNaturalist. I've made some really good connections there. Um, this is a list of all my different sites, my 30. The map is a little bit off, but this is the 30 sites that I visited in the first five years. And the year six, 2023, I went back and replicated uh, the same sites that I did on year one. So that just kind of gives you an indication of West Central Illinois there. Uh, what insects to count? Um, so I wanted to count every insect, not just bees. I, I'm, I guess that's just one of my faults here. I, I'm not satisfied with just counting bumblebees or just counting. It's, it's hard for me just to count butterflies. I want to know everything. I want to know what's out there. And nobody was doing that. So I counted all bees, butterflies, and skippers that were, that were out there, regardless of whether or not they were visiting a flower. And then all wasps, beetles, flies, moths, true bugs, ants, and even things like lace wings and harvestmen that were actually feeding on nectar or pollen or had pollen on their bodies. Um, I did not count uh, tree crickets. I wish I would have. Maybe this next round I'll start counting tree crickets. Um, but that's one I did leave off and I left off Japanese beetles. I got tired of looking at Japanese beetles. I don't think they're contributing positively to pollination. Other insects were observed feeding or pollen on them. Um, I just really think it's important to know, you know what's out there. It's amazing the diversity. So here's my crude field data sheet. Uh, which is kind of embarrassing, I just scribble. Now, keep in mind, I have a camera in my hand and some a few times I tried to carry a net and uh, some vials in case I needed to collect them. Uh, so I'm kind of scribbling. If the common name comes to me, I put that down. If the scientific name comes to me, I put that down and then try to sort it all out with my photographs later. So when I get back to the office, I basically transpose all that into a formal data sheet. And so this is what my data sheet uh, looks like for the first five years. Um, so I was able to record only the different flowers visited by each type of insect. So this red ant would visit, you know, parsnip, dogwood, and dewberry, but I didn't actually record how many times that species of ant was visiting dewberry. So it may have visited dewberry 10 times and the other two once. I didn't get that recorded with the way my methods. Um, so in 2023, going back and doing the replications, I decided to change that up and use a voice recorder. So one of my friends does that. So I went out and bought myself a lanyard and put it around my neck. I usually carry my cell phone in my pocket, but that picks up the ambient noise of you know my shuffling my feet, walking through the vegetation. So I needed the phone you know closer to my mouth to pick up my voice. 
And so this is just a, a very small sample of the data sheet that I get when I come back and listen to myself. Uh, but now I'm able to record what each individual insect is doing and which flower they're visiting. So each interaction, or even if I just see them on the ground or flying around a flower, I'm able to record that now. Uh, so I just have some pie charts looking at the taxa by group. Um, and this is for the first five years because they were a little bit different the first five years. So note that as expected, you know, bees were a big part of the abundance. So I see a lot more individual bees out there on the landscape, but I did not expect that it would only be, you know, a third. So basically two thirds of all the other interactions with the flowers were being done by other insects, especially flies and beetles, uh, butterflies um, as well. But uh, now I'm doing this during the day, so I assume moths would be a lot uh, greater in the evening. Uh, so these are only the daytime moths that I'm counting. Uh, but I was pretty surprised by that. And then when it came to richness, so this is the number of species or the number of taxa. Amazingly, bees, beetles, and flies have about the same number of species or taxa that I counted. Now that's a little bit misleading because of course bees cannot always be identified as readily uh, by sight out in the field or by photograph. Uh, so there's, for example, the sweat bees, Lazioglossum, Lazioglossum subgenus dialectus, the little metallic sweat bees, there may be 40 of them out there. Um, people that have done uh, bee bowl, you know, specimen studies have found about 40 in this area. And so that may be represent 40 different species as one. Um, so I just don't know. I do the best I can, and that's the results that I have. So comparison for each year, just to see how many individual insects I am seeing per hour. Uh, obviously, when I went to voice recording, I had more time because I wasn't constantly, you know, basically picking up and throwing down my notepad and having to write that and missing time photographing. So I'm basically able to dictate and pay a lot more attention. So I'm gonna see a lot more in uh, 2023 when I actually use voice recorder. So my annual taxa numbers, it just kind of shows the different species. So I actually saw more species mm -hmm. in 2021 uh, even though I wasn't doing voice recording, but that's the year that I actually visited some higher quality uh, sand prairies and some hill prairies that are in much better condition uh, and been, have been well managed. Um, so I would have expected uh, to have a little bit higher numbers uh, that year, but the actual number of total individuals, of course, was much higher when I used um, the voice recording. So I thought a thousand more individuals the year I did voice recording uh, compared to the higher quality sites. Okay, just kind of a comparison uh, between the two sites. So this, the five sites or six sites that I visited 2018 to the visits, replicate visits in 2023. Um, so I saw significantly more individuals and more uh, taxa uh, with the voice recorder. And some of these sites are being heavily managed. So they're being intensely managed, a lot of brush clearing, a lot of fire every one to two years. So there's a lot of floral response. So there's a lot of flowers out there. So you kind of would expect more pollinators as long as there's refugia, as long as they're still surviving in the areas outside of the burn, they're able to come back into the areas that were burning and producing more flowers. So you would expect that. Uh, the one outlier here, Mississippi River Sand Hills is a remnant site. It's actually the one close to my house. Um, my colleague decided that we needed to control winged wahoo, black locust, and a lot of uh, blackberry mm -hmm. on the hillsides that we just couldn't get a handle on with cutting. We've been working on them for well over a decade. We just can't seem to reduce the population. So we went out there in late May and we sprayed chemical on them. Um, we tried very carefully to not impact the higher quality areas, but there was impact. Now the sites have since recovered, but when I went out there in June, there were no flowers in June. Because uh, this was a couple of weeks after the spray. There were absolutely no flowers, and I was devastated. So the actual plants did come back, even the ones that had all wilted up. They didn't necessarily flower that year. They hopefully will flower this year. Um, but there was an impact for June and July, and that's why the numbers decreased. So limitations. Most of my surveys are done alone. I've had people um, re recently offer to come with me. Uh, but I tell them, you know, I'm rambling with myself. I'm talking to myself for an hour, so it may not be the best time to go out in the woods with me. Uh, it'd probably be better to come with me when I'm not, you know, talking to myself. Um, I, when I was juggling the clipboard and when I was using a notepad, um, I wasn't able to, of course, record every interaction. 
and it was a lot, it was time consuming. Sometimes I had a net and a collection vial and a clipboard and a camera. Um, so I wasn't getting as much, but both of those issues were resolved with the voice recorder. My maximum rate for the 30 sites, 144 surveys thus far has been about 600 individuals uh, per hour and 70 species per hour. Now that's not every time, that was just the one exceptional. So that kind of shows my maximum efficiency. That's about as many as I can actually process within the hour. June and July, of course, are the best months. I also do April, May, and I do August, September uh, counts. Uh, these rates were close to the maximum ability. I'm a most efficient doing two surveys, two sites per day. I tried three once and I was completely spent. Mentally, I just, I couldn't deal with it. So two, two seemed to work fine for me. Uh, so the top plants. So everybody wants to know, you know, the top plants, what should I plant? These aren't necessarily what you should plant uh, other than mountain mint. Um, some of those you don't want to plant. These are the ones that are being used on the nature preserve. So a lot of times these are the ones that are present most abundantly. Goldenrods don't plant a can of goldenrod, but as Heather Holmes said on Tuesday, there are other goldenrods that you can plant that are very, very important uh, for, for the bees and for other pollinators. Um, there are a bunch of non-natives on this list, but they all belong to the carrot and mustard families. So the wild parsnip, the queen ants lace, the poison hemlock, those are all offer a lot of easy access to flora and pollen. Um, so they're visiting those because the flies and the beetles and stuff that don't have specialized mouth parts can actually feed on them more easily. You know, bees have to have these special tongues adapted to the flowers. So this is everything, not just specialists. So this is all the insects that are visiting flowers. So I've been working with the Natural History Survey. I'm a field person and I have to protect land. Um, so this is kind of a side thing. I do not do statistics. So I'm trying to work with the Natural History Survey, Illinois Natural History Survey, and see about uh, coming up with C values, coefficient of conservatism, so we can assess the sites. And then recently, I asked Casey Carter, who's a pollination biologist with the survey, uh, to do a plant network for me to just document the true bugs, the heteroptera, and their flower associations. I assume this was a smaller group, so it wouldn't quite be as complicated. It's still pretty complicated. Um, and we haven't basically teased through this quite yet, uh, but there was almost 300 different inter interactions uh, in that, uh, but it's kind of interesting what she found. Um, so based on this, um, the ebony bugs, the cormelina, uh, basically are visiting a lot of different types of plants, uh, but the tarnished plant bug, the ligus, they're actually, they're both generalists, but ligus actually spend even amounts of times at different plants. So the ebony bugs might have a preference for basswood. In one case, they really liked basswood. Uh, so there was a lot of ebony bugs on that. Maricorus, which is a leaf-footed bug, is a specialist. The nymphs only visit milkwort. Um, and so they're kind of highly specialized. The arillus or wheel bugs. Wheel bugs probably don't con contribute anything to pollination. It was just kind of incidental. One had pollen on him, so I counted him. Daisy fleabane, amazingly, four true bugs is the most visited, at least in 2023, there were more bugs visiting the little tiny daisy flea banks. You don't go out and plant that one. That one just pops up and you let it grow and you appreciate it and you search it for bugs because it is phenomenal. Golden Alexander, everybody should have Golden Alexander, not just for the bees, uh, but it was the most specialist for the true bugs. So specialized true bugs were visiting um, the Golden Alexanders. So one of the things we're looking at uh, for my study is management. That's a big question that we get. How are we doing our management? Are we doing it right? Are we hurting the insects? Are we helping the insects? Um, we don't know yet. Statistically, it's hard to analyze this, but so far on the ground, we really feel this strong that we are actually are making an impact for the sites that we're doing heavy management on. The sites that we are doing massive clearing and annual to biennial fires. So the time, the, doing the annual fire, the fuel doesn't have time to build up. So when you put a fire across the landscape, it's not as hot. Um, so the little bees and whatnot that are tunneled in the ground probably can survive a lot easier from an annual fire than they can if you wait for three or four years for that thatch to build up and then send a fire through it. Um, so we're thinking that's one of the things that's happening. Most of these sites also have refugia in the area. We're either burning a small portion of it, or if we're burning most of the site, there are other natural areas in the, in the vicinity where the insects are surviving and able to come back and recolonize. But there's a lot of variabilities between each site. Okay, every little site's different, 
Every site reacts differently to the type of management, the temperature, the RH, everything is a little bit different. So this is just one of my sites, Cecil White Prairie is a little Lust Hill Prairie. Um, so the first picture on the left is basically 2018, a little bit later in the season, uh, but there's still a lot more trees. We cleared all those trees in 2023, and I had you know hundreds more pollinators um, and the next the replicate survey than I did because we basically have released that sunlight and all these uh, flowers in the seed bank are popping up and, and blooming. And that was just an incredible site. That's, that's the one I'm really proud of. We've done a lot of good things in the management of that site. So what I learned, diversity was good at all sites. Even my teeny tiny one acre cemeteries had really good diversity. Now, some of the insects that I'm seeing in these one acre cemeteries are all surrounded by corn fields and bean fields. So there's not a lot of uh, refugia habitat there. And a lot of them had corn earworms that were visiting the flowers. And so they were less conservative insects in some cases. But in other cases, I found bees that I found nowhere else in Western Illinois. Um, so some rare conservative bees were still in these tiny little remnants. So it's very interesting. I didn't realize how important the non-native plants are serving a role uh, for these pollinators. I do not suggest that anybody go out and plant, you know, wild parsnip or Queen Anne's lace. But if it's there, they're using it. So we got to think about when I control the uh, autumn olive, when we cut autumn olive and take that away from all the bumblebees, are we putting something back? Are we planting prairie crab apples so that the bumblebees have a native food source that they can go to flowering at the same time or you know, similar uh, foraging patterns? Uh, so we give them something native because that's what they're used to anyway. They're just doing this. They're visiting garlic mustard because it's abundant in the environment and we don't have any other native cresses out there. We don't have enough you know, meadow, um, parsnip, things like that in the woods. They're actually going to the invasive as a substitute where what's missing in the environment. The impact of domesticated feral honeybees, uh, we very are very concerned about, but it came, it was actually minimal. A few sites did have feral hives, but for the most part, the percentage of honeybees was very, very low compared to everything else, the other bees and all the other insects. Community associations is pro problematic. I can't tell you which insects are prairie insects versus which ones are woodlands because these insects will visit the flowers that they prefer. So they will go to those flowers wherever they are. So if we're kind of on the border, they'll go back and forth if those plants are there. So there's a lot of transition going on with these managed sites. And so you really can't pinpoint them down. And as I said, this high intensity, intensity transformative management is basically showing some promise. Um, so this is just, I want a chance to basically talk about some of the underdogs. Before I get into bugs, just talk a little bit about beetles. Though so they represented in 2023, uh, they represented, um, I can't read that, but I think it's about 16 and 18, 18 and 17 percent of the total individuals and total of species were beetles. And so just a few of them that don't get any love here. Uh, jewel beetles, click beetles. I didn't not know how much cliff beetles, especially in the spring, actually feed on pollen. Darkling beetles, those aren't supposed to be pollinators. Fireflies, definitely I see a lot of fireflies uh, in the summertime feeding on nectar. Soldier beetles, case maker leaf beetles, uh, kind of an unusual one there. Uh, flower weevils, of course, you have to look really close. They're really, really tiny. They are all over flowers. Blister beetles, flower scarabs, uh, this particular flower scarab is on a basswood, had a basswood limb hanging down so I could actually see the basswood flowers. A lot of times we can't see the pollinators high up in the canopy, so we don't know what's going on. I had an intern that actually strung up a little uh, uh, vein traps for bees up in the top canopy to actually document the bees visiting up there. So flies, uh, flies were 70% of the um, richness, so the amount of species, but the abundance was, or sorry, Sorry, flies were 23% of the taxa in 2023, which is actually quite amazing. But again, I'm not able to count all the different species of bees. So that's a little bit uh, misleading, but flies are hugely important. In fact, in my studies, they're far more important uh, than butterflies, skippers, and moths uh, put together. Uh, so mosquitoes, these are all boys, of course. The male mosquitoes, I love. Those are so pretty. Um, they will feed on nectar. Deer flies, we all hate them. Uh, I don't mind them as long as they're visiting a flower and not trying to bite me. Uh, picture wing flies don't visit flowers very often, but they're pretty. 
dance flies uh, is on milkweed and crane flies. I'd always heard crane flies don't feed. That's not true. Uh, crane flies will sip on nectar and I've got lo lots of different species that I've photographed of crane flies feeding on flowers. Midas flies, of course, they're, they're very common. That species in particular visits rattlesnake master. It's a specialist. Cluster flies, um, you know, dung flies, things like that. They visit flowers as well. And this little tangle flame fly I was pretty proud of. Uh, one of my friends, uh, Betsy Beatros, uh, posted on Facebook a couple weeks before I saw this. She talked about this really loud fly, hearing this really loud noise. And then she saw it. And it looks kind of like a bee fly, but it's its own weird little creature. Um, but I heard that noise. I went out to Sand Perry that week. And I heard that noise. I go, oh my gosh, that's Betsy's fly. Where is it? And I found both the male and the female. Um, pretty unusual fly. Tech in flies, uh, what a diverse group. I'm not mentioning surfing flies. Everybody knows about surfing flies. These are the underdogs. Thick headed flies, also really, really cute. True bugs. So, this is kind of what I came to talk about. So, like I said, I'm here for the underdog. I feel like there's a lot of funding right now. As Heather said on Tuesday, stop chasing the big bumbles. There's money for that. There's people out there doing that. What we need is more people out there, more citizen scientists out there taking pictures of the underdogs, the ones that people aren't studying, the ones that there's no funding for. Uh, so nobody, a lot, a lot of true bugs are rare, but nobody's studying them, so we don't know. We don't know which one's rare. There is a stink bug that was found on a hill prairie down in Southern Illinois in the 80s that hasn't been seen since. Well, if nobody goes out there, we don't know. Maybe it is more common and people just haven't looked. I always hear that all the time. People haven't looked. I get so tired of that. I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm doing the best I can. Uh, so anyway, this is the true bugs. So they represented about 7% of the species. And these were the bugs visiting the flowers. And then they found almost 8% of the different uh, uh, abundance of the whole number of individuals. Right. So some bugs are highly specialized. So I love it the fact that the more I study these, the more I see these associations that some bugs absolutely have their particular plan that they spend a lot of time on. You're almost always in the right environment, you will find these bugs on these plants. So that's pretty cool. And so I kind of list uh, the important ones out there and I'm gonna go over some of these. Assassin bugs, they're supposed to kill other bugs. They're not supposed to be feeding on flowers. They feed on flowers. So milkweed, milkweeds aren't just for monarchs. Um, so, and the milkweed bugs are kind of rather popular out there. But there's other ones that a lot of people haven't seen these pink bordered stink bugs. Um, they're absolutely gorgeous, probably a little bit more of a southern uh, species, but I found them several times and I found them exclusively on milkweeds. The four o'clock bug is so named because it visits Mirabilis, four o'clock. And supposedly it's a western species that kind of the plant came uh, eastward because of the trains. So the bug followed it. I have never seen them on four o'clock in Illinois. I've always seen them on milkweed. So at least in Illinois, it seems like they're adapting uh, mostly to common milkweed. Mountain mint is my favorite plant, mountain mint. It attracts so many bugs. So a couple of these bugs, especially the two on, two on the left, um, they actually live on mountain mint pretty much their whole life. They actually lay their eggs, I think, into the flower heads. I see them December 23rd. I saw both those two species on the mountain mint dried up flower heads. I saw nymphs, I saw adults, they breed there, they, they, they basically do everything. They feed with the nymphs, they're all there. This long neck seed bug is supposed to be a dirt bug, dirt colored seed bugs, what it was the family it's in. They're on that flower. Um, they're visiting that, both the nymphs and the adults are visiting mountain mint. Uh, this red shouldered bug uh, is moving up. This is a beneficiary of climate change. So we didn't used to see them here, this year, I found them in three different locations. Previously, they'd only been known from the St. Louis area. So that bug is moving north. I think I think Ilona found one up in Wisconsin, but that's as far north as they've been seen. Kind of interesting that we see some of these. Legumes. Legumes are very important. Now, of course, partridge pea does not produce nectar, except for the little nectaries on the stem. So that bug there is feeding on pollen. So that rapid plant bug is definitely foraging on pollen. Um, these, uh, I love these things. These, the nymphs of this leaf-footed bug, Physiogaster, are flattened, dorsiflatedly flattened and green. So they blend in really well, but they love tick tree fall. And you can oftentimes find those little things. Sometimes you find the adults kind of at the base of the flower head, kind of clustered up in their little mating balls or whatever. Um, sometimes they'll bite off the heads or suck the juices below the flower, um, but they all have a purpose. Um, 
The broad-headed bugs really like legumes. I worry about those a lot of times because my colleagues and occasionally myself are out having to do spot treatments of Cerisia lesbidiza and rarely um, sweet clovers. These bugs visit those legumes and I hate that I'm spraying and I'm seeing bugs everywhere. So it's making it really hard for me to do my job. It's hard to collect seeds anymore because everywhere I look, I find bugs. The bugs are all over. I don't want to kill my bugs when I'm collecting the seed. So on one hand, I can actually move the bugs, and that could be a good thing if I'm moving it to a close place where they want bugs, but I don't want to lose the bugs. So I kind of want to keep my bugs in my backyard. So I worry about that now. Scopular ACAs and um, some of the mint family have these purple tube-like flowers. The two uh, twice-stabbed stink bug, these little red and black guys, they love to actually get inside these little flowers of the uh, obedient plant. They love. There's something about... Um, the glands, the glandular um, um, uh, juices or whatever on this plant. So there's the little nymphs. They love these plants. Uh, this is one of my favorite. I have not seen these elsewhere but my yard. I planted a lot of rattlesnake master in my yard. I don't know where they came from, but they love my yard. They are in my yard from July until freeze up. They're probably still out there. I haven't burned yet, so they're probably still in the rattlesnake master seed heads. Um, I probably should collect some seed heads and put them aside. So when I burn, I'm not burning up the little guys. Um, but I have burned my yard, and they're still doing very, very well. Um, just a cute little stink bug that previously was known to visit Queen Anne's Lace. In my yard, they visit Rattlesnake Master, and they don't visit anything else. Uh, some of the assassin bugs, I wouldn't necessarily say they're specialists, although this, this uh, zealous really, really likes goldenrod. You see them feeding on nectar of goldenrod. Of course, they're out there looking for other midges and things to eat. Um, the orange assassin bug obviously likes to visit yellow flowers because it blends in a lot better and can hunt, but I've actually seen them feeding on nectar and pollen as well. Asters, of course, there's a lot of asters out there, in the bar, even the weedy asters. Um, the insidious pirate bugs are actually thought to be non-native. Um, they you actually can buy some of them to control thrips. Uh, really, really tiny. A lot of times I photograph these incidentally. So I'm photographing another larger bug and then I'll see, oh yeah, there's a, when I look, I basically bring it back to my computer and blow it up. So, ah, there's insidious pirate bug there. Uh, little de teeny tiny things. Uh, I don't think they're doing anything bad to the environment yet. We just don't understand uh, some of these natives. Obviously there are Carolina mantids and there are some really, or sorry, Chinese mantids out there doing some really nasty things and not all, you know, non-natives are, are certainly good for the other insects. Our red spot aster mirrored is a specialist on asters. And again, the daisy flea banes, so, so important. Um, so tarnished plant bug will visit absolutely anything, but these uh, scentless plant bugs seem to have a preference uh, for daisy flea banes. And they're kind of pinkish in color. Uh, they're just really pretty, but that's, you know, a tiny little flower. I've seen them on asters too, of course, because it's very similar uh, flower structure. Prickly pear cats, cactus. These cactus corides, are, they're uh, I think uh, Central Illinois is the furthest north they've been seen. They're seen in Missouri as well. They have to be on prickly pear cactus. Their whole life is spent on prickly pear cactus. So the little nymphs and the adults, um, a lot of times they're feeding on the pad, they're feeding on the juices. But that flowering plant is everything. That's the whole world for these cactus corides. Flowering spurge, um, these are forbia bugs. They'll visit a few other types of spurge, but flowering spurge is their favorite. They have these little flattened pieces on their third uh, antennal segment. Um, they have that as a ba babies as well. And I mentioned the Maricorus, which is a leaf-footed bug. Uh, there's a nymph visiting milkwort. Um, I've seen the adults on goldenrod and Indian hemp. Uh, they look like they're covered in velvet. They have these matted, you know, multicolored hairs that are kind of pressed against their body and just kind of funky shaped. And it's just really, really cute. Nothing else looks like them. The false milkweed bug. Um, so these get confused a lot of times with the small milkweed bugs. Small milkweed bugs on the back of their thorax have a single heart. Uh, the false milkweed bugs have two hearts stacked on top of each other. The small milkweed bug usually has a white border on the tip of their, the black tip of the wings there. This one does not. This one is associated with oxide false sunflower, so Heliopsis. So if you have Heliopsis, you'll have this bug. It can be in big numbers. They will visit a lot of other flowers, but they can seem to have to raise their babies on Heliopsis. So they have to lay their eggs and their little nymphs develop on the Heliopsis. 
Um, so very common with the other milkweed bugs, but you need the plant oxide false sunflower. Um, anybody plant uh, biennial gara? If you look at biennial gara, which is such a cool plant, um, it's not very showy, but when it blooms, it's just covered in these bugs, these little stilt bugs. I found the nymphs this, this last year as well. Um, they spend all their time. They There's something about the glands produced, um, the substances produced on these plants and the stems. Uh, this is also, this is now an, an onothera. This is with the common evening primrose. So they'll be on that one as well. But for some reason, the biennial gara really attracts them. And just, they start to disperse as I take photographs, but there was a lot of them on there. Common ragweed, of course, don't plant this, but if you have it, um, appreciate it a little bit. It is native. Um, this ornate plant bug, I typically find exclusively on common ragweed. Um, there's a lot of bugs. There's a lot of uh, wasps and flies uh, that use, um, basically kind of drill into the stems of, of ragweed, both common and giant, uh, and spend their whole lives out. There's a lot of little tiny uh, leaf hoppers that live in giant ragweed. It's kind of a lot like cup plant. It provides these little homes for them to hide away in. Um, so amazing plant. I used to always hate golden, you know, giant ragweed. Got to get rid of that. And now I actually leave a little bit. I don't want it competing with my conservative prairie plants, of course, but if I have a little bit down in the backside of the wet area, I'd say, yeah, it, it's so, it provides such good opportunities to photograph uh, insects on the giant ragweed that I've grown to appreciate giant ragweed. Obviously, I don't have bad allergies. Sometimes I do, but not too bad. So this uh, Metro Camaris, I've not seen it feeding on this plant, but always, always associated with, with the spider warts and carrion flowers that have these flower clusters they're very um I don't know, it's just kind of a smooth texture to them but they find they basically live in those little flower clusters but really pretty there's different color variations they can have all black you can have a red thorax with all black um, abdomen abdomen and wings there uh, but really pretty little bugs found in the spider warts uh, the nymphs of the common green stink bug seem like they developed alongside orange jewelweed, don't they? They look like they have such great camouflage. And I find the nymphs very often on orange jewelweed. The adults don't visit flowers very often, but I did see this adult feeding on common milkweed plant. Um, these are the ones that people are already starting to see. We had these 78 degree wet days down here in Illinois, and people were going out and seeing green stink bugs out in the woods. It's probably the most abundant a uh, stink bug that we see when we start to, uh, to get ready for a prescribed burn season. These things are all over the woods popping out and fortunately they fly so they can get away. This is an elderberry plant bug only found on elderberry bushes. Um, so really cool. A lot of times you can't identify Noroclopus as two um, genus but or species, just genus. And But this one's a little bit different. It's a little black plotchy, but they really, I never plant elderberries, but I love elderberries. So when they pop up, you just kind of appreciate them. So a few other plants, like I said, not all bugs, of course, are specialists. Um, so there's, and don't just plant the ones that are, you know, cater to the specialists. All these, all these flowers uh, are additional flowers that can provide a lot of nectar and resources for bugs to attract bugs. I can't mention enough. Once again, I've said golden Alexander and mountain mint. Those are important. <laughs> Indian hemp. It's another one I didn't plant, but it's popped up in my prairie. And so I kind of let it um, I wish I had some dog bane. I don't have a lot of shade in my three acre yard, um, but both the Indian hemp and the other dog banes uh, really provide um, attractant uh, to these bugs. On the very left is the spine soldier bug, which everybody hates because they kill their killers um, and they will feed on caterpillars, including monarch caterpillars, and they will suck them dry. But I always think that, you know, those are probably the caterpillars that are not the healthiest. Usually the predators are very good about cleaning up our systems. And so we need predators. Even now the Leopold found when they killed all, you know, the wolves and the coyotes, you know, the deer population expanded. So we need predators. I really have a problem with people bringing things inside. I'm going to protect it. I'm going to protect it from everything. Well, these predators need food too. These are native. Um, so I really think that if you leave them alone out in the environment, they will basically, the strong will survive. Um, but I got I love tech ended flies. I love these predatory uh, bugs. Um, and there they are sipping on nectar. Who would have thought? We're finding out that a lot of the times these bugs have 
varied diets. They don't just fit the mold. MJ Hatfield always tells me, insects do not follow the book. Angela, she says, they don't pay attention to what we write about them. They have their own way of doing things. And so it's very hard to learn about insects because they live in a different world than we do. But how fascinating to try. Of course, purple cone flowers, the pale purple and the purple cone flower are just absolutely amazing. I love it. These little jab jagged ambush bugs, jabs, I call them. They actually, they're very noticeable in there. They're not hiding very well, but they still kill things. They basically sit in, they basically, two of them have tucked themselves into the uh, cone flower head there, waiting for prey to come. Uh, so I just thought that was kind of neat. I see them frequently there, but there's a lot of insects that will feed on the pollen of these cone flowers. Black-eyed Susans, I, as a butterfly person, I've done butterfly surveys for over 25 years. And I never saw a lot of butterflies on uh, black-eyed Susans. I thought, yeah, they're kind of, they're out there, but, you know, they're not visited very much. Bugs love black-eyed Susans. Absolutely love them. So on the left is that spined assassin bug. Again, this, these are assassin bugs. They're not supposed to be feeding on nectar and pollen. The damsel bug, same thing. That's a killer. What's it doing? It's got pollen all over its face. and It's been sucking on, you know, nectar. And it's got pollen all over it. So when it moves to another sunflower, it's going to spread that pollen. Is it as doing it as efficiently as bees? Of course not. But I think there's a role that they're all playing that we just don't understand. We don't understand what these insects are doing and the contributions they're having. So I'm trying to bring that to light. Speaking out for the underdogs. Golden Alexanders. Everyone should have Golden Alexanders. I have planted so much Golden Alexander in my yard. Almost everybody else would say I have enough. I don't think you can have enough golden alexander. That's one of those few ones that it's the first thing to bloom after my uh, prairie willows. Uh, so it provided, here in Illinois, it starts flowering in April and goes through at least into May. Now this year it may not, it may flower in March, who knows. Uh, we're having a weird year, but it provides that early um, nectar pollen source that these insects need so desperately. And there's a lot of true bugs that will visit mine. I finally did get the specialist bee the uh, Andrina Zizé, uh, it did come to my Golden Alexanders. It took me about six years of planting, 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 but the bug basically came from the nature reserve and found my site. So I got this little oasis backyard where I get the, so I basically have planted a restoration, reconstruction um, near a known natural area. So I have a source of where the bugs are coming from. I have 2000 different invertebrates that I have photo, doc photo documented within my three acre backyard. They wouldn't be there if there hadn't been, I mean, it was a mowed lawn when we bought our property and we have slowly over the last 15 years converted it to uh, at least 50% plus native and they're finding it. They're finding my yard. So it's important to have that source, but we can also found out you can get some really rare stuff. I've got listed bees, well, soon to be listed, I hope, <laughs> fingers crossed, uh, that have shown up in my backyard because they came from the remnant. So they came from a source. They will move. You can do good things with reconstructions, but you need that source population. You need to protect the remnants, not just replant. You have to think about what you're doing um, as much as possible to try to save them. Pussy toes, I can't seem to plant pussy toes. They require really poor soil and they're short. They can't handle competition, but I have a hill prairie next door um, that has a lot of pussy toes and I love these big eyed bugs. I had never seen big eyed bugs visiting flowers. This one was definitely going after the pollen. Um, and so cute. And again, there's the white margin burrow bug. These actually take care of their babies. Um, they actually have a little nest and they have provide maternal care for their babies. Um, well, quinine, another one I never figured out because I never saw a lot of butterflies on it. So when I did butterflies, I like, oh, what gives wild quinine? I guess I'll include it because it's conservative. Their bugs love it. It blooms for a long time and just provides really good resources. There's some rare wasps that have also visited this one. Bergamot, of course, bergamot and spotted bee balm in the sand prairies, uh, just huge. Um, for all insects, um, you need to have monarda, um, just really, really important. I just love watching. Hard to photograph because of the, the uh, it's not a flat surface. And so the bugs are getting in there and on the different flowers. The little bees are out there at the tip. But it's a fun one. I like the challenge. Coreopsis, another one I never thought was important at all. But you have to look really close, sometimes on the underside. Uh, but the bugs are visiting that. Dirt-colored seed bug, what on earth is it doing out of the dirt? Certainly enough, it was feeding on pollen. Um, so these plant bugs feeding on it. A gray-headed coneflower, again, that leaf-footed bug that flattened, it's feeding on the nectar there on the side of the gray-headed coneflower. Um, the uh, 
uh, mountain mint uh, seed bug there is on the gray head coneflower and the eustachius is brown very common brown stink bug identified by a belly shot um, there's different colorations on their belly um, the spiracles things like that you have to have belly shots you have to get underneath them to get a photograph and ironweed is one of my favorites absolutely love it i actually my ironweed attracted a really rare uh, cuckoo bee this year got real excited we were going to uh, propose it for listing but because we're finding it in a few places uh, it's not going to be listed yet um, but I mean, what a fascinating thing to find in my 15-year-old reconstruction uh, to find rare things. So if, we're inter if you're interested in more information, uh, basically I take a lot of my photographs. I put a whole bunch of stuff on iNaturalist, uh, anything especially that's new, a new documentation I put on there. But I have worked with the Field Museum in Chicago to create um, field guides for myself. So basically I put um, my photos of um, all the wasps that I had. Uh, that's the first one I did in 2020 when COVID hit. I went out, oh my gosh, I can do wasp now. So I went out and made this. These are free downloads. So what I do is I, this is a common um, wild bee gener. I have two sheets to that one. And you basically print out a color copy. And then I have a laminator, which is uh, pretty cheap. The uh, color copies aren't so cheap. But basically I take these out in the field for BioBlitz events, things like that. And I actually have a little when I don't have the internet and books are hard to lug around. So I have these sheets with these photographs side by side so I can compare them. I do that with moths. I've created five guides for moths because there is no good field guide. I love the gardening for moths, but that wasn't out at that time. So I love that book. Absolutely love it. But for my needs, I want to know what's in my backyard, what's in the Midwest um, that I'm looking for when I go out night lighting. Um, and then just recently, uh, Heather Holm approached me a couple years ago about doing a book on flower bugs. And so it gave me a chance to basically highlight my photographs on all these floral visitations. So that's what the book is. It's a field guide um, to basically help you recognize and go out in the field and where to find them, what flowers they're associated with. I'm just trying to uh, increase the knowledge and appreciation because when people talk about pollinators, nobody yet is talking about bugs. Uh, while they're not a big important um, insect in the pollinator world, they are out there and I want people to start looking and start appreciating bugs.